Hello, dog. And hello, everybody. Yeah, else. hey, hey, just a sec. Sorry, I'm trying a different machine. <sighs> Whoa. Hold on. I need to quit and, and do something. Hold on a sec. As long as you come back, it's all good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, hold on a minute. Let's see if this works. All right, you can see my window, right? Yep. Yes. Right. Okay, good. Uh, let's see. Participants, where's my chat? There we go. Oh. Hello. Different... Hello. Just trying a different machine today. It's taking me a while to get set up here. Hold on a sec. This is a new machine, or is this a uh, when you're uh, just borrowing because you lost yours? <laughs> I, actually, I've had this machine for a long time. I just don't ever really use it. I decided eh, might as well try it. It has a it has a it has a bigger CPU and stuff, so it should be able to handle virtual conferences and stuff a lot better than my old one. My old one's kind of dying, so yeah, it tends to happen. Yeah. Okay. How are you there? Hello. Hello. Slinky. Hello. Hello. Yo, Tommy. Yo. Hello. Uh, Scott. Doug, Doug, Doug. Hey, and Christoph. Hi. Hello, Christoph. I'll get it right one of these days. Uh, da -da -da. Lucas. Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Oh, wait. Other one, right? Sorry. Oh, I'll take both of you. I see you both came up. Yeah, that's good enough. <laughs> okay. Oops. And Manuel. Hi. Hello. Lou, are you there? Hi. Hi. Good morning. I love the commentaries from John. Oh, man. So that's interesting. Christoph, did you make that edit? Who made the edit? Yeah, I, I made it. Was it's it pretty... a suggestion? You have to accept it, I guess. Yeah, it does. I just, I'm surprised it didn't show it as a suggestion. Why didn't it? Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah that Sorry was weird. Sorry for a complicated name. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just, I normally it pops up as a little bubble on the right here, but I didn't see it right away. So that was just weird. All right, uh, Klaus. Hello. Hello. Hey, Ginger. Hello. <laughs> Jesse. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Christian, are you there? Yes, hello. Hello. All right. Hi. Hey, Remy. How's it going? Good. Hey, Eric. So I don't have oh. background noise. Antonio, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Hello. So while we're waiting, Antonio, I think you never mentioned what company you work for if you want to be associated with a company. No, I'm I'm okay with that. Thank you. We I'm sorry, say it again. You're aware with who? No, no, I'm I'm okay with any any company. 
Okay, got it. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. All right, three after. Let's see, I got everything. I got everybody so far. Do, do, do. Let's get started here. Um, okay, just a reminder, Clemens, you have quite a few AIs that are kind of building up there a little. Yes. Um, yep. Okay, community time. Anything from the community people want to bring up? All right, cool. Okay, we skipped the SDK call last week, interop. Um, I don't think there's anything on the agenda right now for interop, but it may be good just to have a five minute discussion just to find out where people are relative to it. So we'll have that right after this call. Yep. Uh, um, let's see, okay, EU. Um, I'm sorry, KubeCon EU. Should we cancel the calls next week? I'm inclined to say yes, but I wanna hear what everybody else has to say. Uh, probably won't be on the call. <laughs> okay, let me just yeah. double check here. Uh, yeah, I don't think any of our sessions overlap, but do people want to cancel or keep it? Any objection to canceling? Because hopefully people will try to attend KubeCon. <sighs> I've got a couple of yeses, Remy and uh, Manuel, so let's go ahead and do that. Oops. Weird. Okay. Um, okay, so office hours. Um, I, I apologize. <clears throat> I don't remember who it was that mentioned it last week. I don't know. It may have been you, David, that said they may be able to, um, to participate in the office hours. Um, we need to know technically as soon as possible. The, end, the deadline was technically yesterday. But they did respond back to me saying if we had more people, just let them know. So let me know. And if you are going to join, so for example, Clement and Klaus, please go to the RSVP link here and make sure you sign up. I'm not quite sure what happens when you do that. I went there and I got an email, but I haven't actually looked at it yet. But they probably need to make sure that they understand who you are so they can send you the invite to the, um, to the Zoom call or whatever it's going to be. OK? And just let me know offline if you do want to join the fun. Okay. I think it's after my uh, talk, so if you want more people, I can probably attend because I have to get up at 3 a.m. anyway. <laughs> okay, yeah, it'd be great if you could join. Anybody can join. I just found sure. out that I won't be able to join because it overlaps with a couple of the sessions that I'm doing, but I'll try to join later um, after my sessions are over, but we need other people there for who, who, who could definitely be there. I, I think I'll be on the one on Wednesday. The one on Thursday, I'm not sure I want to get it twice in a row at like crazy time. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Is this both days or is this both days or just Wednesday? Whichever day you can do. It's technically both days. All right, thanks. Okay, I guess I just ping me offline um, and I'll, I'll let them know that uh, uh, you to add your name to the list. Um, I'll, I'll let them know about you, Remy. All right, uh, let's see. Tim is on the call and I haven't heard from him so I don't know if there's any updates there. So before we jump into the PRs and stuff, any other topic uh, to add to the agenda? All right. So Clemens, I, maybe we should wait for John to show up because he he specifically wanted this brought up to the top of the list, even though you have an outstanding AI. So I'll tell you what, why don't we go ahead and do that? Because he may have some questions on there. So let's skip that one for right now. So this one. Um, is another John one, but I think we can talk about it without him here. So he opened up this PR uh, to modify the primer to talk about versioning of attributes and stuff like that. And we merged it into master. So the change is, is approved in general. The question for the group here is whether this is worthy enough to go into a 101 as a hotfix or whether we want to save it for a 102. Does anybody have any opinions on that? It is just the primer, it's not the spec. No opinions? Does anybody feel like if we did this, it would violate our rule of typos, only going in as hotfixes? Obviously this is bigger than a typo, but it is clarity and just in the primer. It's a typo. It's a massive typo. Is that what you're saying? 
Okay. I, I personally, I don't have an opinion either way. I'm okay with it going in. I, I like clarity and since it's not touching the spec, I'm okay with it, but. It, I'm, I'm fine with it for, for okay. it should be expandable. Okay. And Lance, thank you for jumping in there. Okay. So any objection to treating this as a typo type fix and merging into 101 as a hot fix? Okay. Um, oops. Per. All right, cool. Thank you all. All right, Slinky, you are up. Would you like to introduce this one to people? Oh, let me go back over here first. There you go. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, just to um, make simpler the usage, more straightforward the usage of dialog uh, filters. Uh, so basically the filter today is, um, is an object composed by just one inner object. While I think it would be better to, to take this kind of approach where the filter is an object that contains the various dialects and dialects and and the evaluation does the end of the results of this dialect. So basically, this is just a shortcutting mechanism. Yeah, it's a shortcutting mechanism, and it's let's say yeah. Bit, yeah. So one of any uh, simpler to use. Yeah, and yeah. where is it? Typo. There was something else. Where was it? Yeah, yeah no, think... there was a. Th no, I I fixed the typo. Uh, but then, yeah, this one, yeah, just yeah, this one. I so, think there's one other spot you need, you might need to change just in the pseudo schema, right? The, um, where is it? Well, I, I changed the open API. No, I mean that, 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 that too. Yes. Why am I, sorry, in the wrong branch. Subscription. Uh, I think this needs to be a star. Oh, okay. Yeah, can you can you please? Um, yeah, can, can you please link this paragraph in the issue? So, I'll... yep. Thanks. Uh, oh. Okay. Like, do we do we uh, do we sync the because we did the last the last work we did was really on the on the spec on the Open API doc, and I'm not sure whether the 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 um, spec is actually back in sync. I don't know for sure. I don't remember. Because I... Sweet. Which set of changes? You mean the, this, the, the shape of the filter stuff? So, Slinky, can you explain what the, the change again? Like the one-off to any-off? Uh, because because any-off allows more than one, while one-off allows exactly one match yeah the idea is that you have a filter like so so we had a discussion about this and we actually landed in this place where you have one filter and then if you want to have multiple filters you use the any the any composition because because you just you just introduce an any composition here that's implied this is all composition not any this is that, all uh, yeah composition yeah i mean it's I think it's an. Uh, I, I've opened this PR because I think it's a necessary. Um, it's a necessary to have that um, that kind of data structure where you need to have all, and then inside all you have the filter, and then filter exact and so on. But 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 but, but it could also be just a SQL filter, or just a like any single filter will be will be sufficient. Correct. He's just saying he'd like a, he'd like an implicit and around us, so you yeah. don't have to do so you don't have to do the filter and and then put these two under the and. He just wants an implied one. So it's a syntactical shortcut is what he's looking for. I think. Yeah, it, it's a user, it's a usability change, basically, making it simpler to use it. Does that make sense, Clemens? Not whether you agree or not, but does it make sense in terms of what he's trying to propose? Yeah, okay, so. So first level at the top level there's always an and. That's what he's implying. Yes. Uh, can I see the Can I see the change again? It's not just at the top level. It's at the filter object level. Okay. 
which at the end of the day, if I can add something, at the end of the day, that's, uh, I'm not sure if you know the open API uh, security requirement object, uh, which has an end or semantic, and it works exactly like that. More than having the all and any, which for them is and and or, they just differentiate between uh, object and array. It's a bit, I think it's a bit more complicated the system, but the fact that they have the end, which is just the elements of the object is simpler. So let me see. So for the all filter, you also change that. So the filter entry, so now I have an all filter where each item was either a filter or an all filter or an any filter, and now it is what? It's an any of. Well, uh, to be to be honest, uh, I'm not 100% sure the change they did to the Open API, and I'm more than happy to review it again. Uh, but the idea is that uh, any member, I mean, or the filter object, which is not the filter schema that we have here, because filter schema is more like base uh, filter yeah. object, right? Um, the filter object uh, with this change becomes a list of entries where each entry is a filter dialect, and then it does the end between the all different dialects. So <clears throat> I think it'd be useful if we take this one step at a time without getting into whether the actual open API changes are right or not. What do people think in general about having an implied and, or do people not like that and they want people to be very explicit and say and around stuff like this? So how do I do an or then? Like for me, for me, this is a consistency question. So for the, the simplest case is that you have, the, and that, that, was the, that was the goal of it. The simplest case is you don't have a single, you don't have multiple conditions, but you just one. And then you just put the filter in and you're done. So if you have a filter, and at the SQL filter, you say filter, SQL expression, thank you very much. Or you have a filter, um, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the dialect is, and you put your own, own decision. And then if you have more complex stuff, and, and that is exactly as it is in, in JSON schema, and, and arguably also as it is in, um, in, in XML or any other compositions, you, you make up a, a bracket, which is the any or the all, which means there's an or composition or there's an, um, an and composition, and that's where you stash the other the, the filters into. Now, like with this top level construct, we're now special casing, special casing all, um, while having a, 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 and then any, the or would then be a different construct. No, 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 Clemens, it's not just for the top level. It's for every, for the filter object itself. Hold on a second, Lucas, can you go on mute? I think there's some background noise with your papers shuffling. Lucas, you there? Uh, yeah, hold on, let me do that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, go ahead, Slinky. No, I, I, I was saying that uh, it's not for the, um, um, what you think you misunderstood is that I'm not talking about only the top level filter. I'm talking about the filter object itself. And by the spec, the filter object is a map of, of dialect where there can be only one key value, okay? And what I'm changing is that I'm saying, no, in this map, you can have several dialects and we will do the end of the evaluation of this. How does or work? Or works the same as before. But, but why, why are or and, and and different? Because it's, it's sim uh, for simplicity here. I think I, mean, I don't. I don't think he's getting rid of the end, Clemens. If that's what you're yeah, thinking. Yeah, I'm not getting rid of the end. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. If you need to define something simple, like uh, you want to have just two filters and you want to match both, then you can do this. Then, if you want to go complex and do uh, complex any uh, any and all uh, filter 
um, composition, you use all and any as before. Yeah, but, but if you if you just switch back to the definition, I mean, you literally have an example here where you say there's an any off, and there will be an all off in uh, in JSON schema. I mean, it literally has like if you want to have all off which we don't have here at this case, but that's that's exactly how, how, how JSON schema does it, right? You either have an any, or you have a one-off, which we don't have for the filters, or you have an, or you have an all-off. Like, like the, the structure in JSON schema, which people will presumably then be be aware of, right, is, exactly the, is exactly the same. Well, I can, I can argue on that, because in fact, a, a JSON schema is, um, like, like the schema object itself is a list of keywords and the schema is an end of those keywords. Uh, so uh, every, so I, I, I'm, uh, actually my, your example is more uh, distant from JSON schema than my example. Because if you look at the spec of JSON schema, uh, again, it's uh, um, every keyword is a predicate and the schema object is the end of those predicates. So that that's at least I mean that's that's where I'm coming from, and that's why when I saw the spec, uh, I said, yeah, it's too much verbose for that for doing the all. So 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 your primary so your primary objection is to get rid of the all. No 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 I don't want to get rid of the all. No, 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 I, no. I'm just I'm just saying. Uh, for cosmetic purposes. It's too much verbose. Clement, he, he's not getting rid of the the and or the all, whatever you want to call it. All he's saying is in cases like this, it it's, is, it's annoying to have to wrapper it with the and. Why not make it implicit? Okay, so yeah, so he's getting he's getting rid of the all the 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 all construct. No, you could you could still wrapper this with an all is what he's saying, but you could also just have a list and the and the all is implied. Yeah, I would. Uh, so, so then I would. Then I would. If we if we do this, I would strike the all. That is another option. Yes. It depends on what. It depends on whether you want something implicit or you want to force people to be explicit. I think that's what it comes down to. Because I, I would prefer not to have two constructs for the same thing. Why? Why? Why, sh why should we force people to one or the other? I mean, it, it's a no-brainer to support that. So. Honestly, I don't, I don't see, I mean, I, I think it's a no-brainer to support it and at the same time, it, you're just making it simpler for some use cases, while for other use cases, it's just better to do the whole tree with all and any. Okay. Does anybody else want to chime in here in terms of how they view this? Is it a nice thing to do? Is it going to be confusing to have two ways to do something. It's the first time I've looked at the filter stuff personally, but um, it feels to me like and will be vastly, I suspect it will be vastly more widely used. And I like the idea of being able to do it explicitly where that does make things more readable um, and implicitly in the common case. So. I haven't looked at the PR to see how it's achieved, but uh, judging by the discussion, if I've understood it correctly, I'd be in favor. But okay. With a very, very low weighting, not having looked at the filtering at all before. Okay, thank you, John. Anybody else would like to chime in? I'm gonna pick on somebody then. Scott, I'd like to get your take on this from maybe a Knative perspective, if there is one. I, I don't think we would ever uh, expose this in like a top level resource because it's too chatty, right? But I think uh, something highly declarative that could talk to systems that consume this would be interesting. Right, but do you have any opinion on whether it's better to support both mechanisms or should we only say, no, we're gonna choose either implicit or explicit, but not both? Uh, yeah, I would choose one way. Okay, thank you, sir. Anybody else want to chime in? Let me put it this way. Um, would anybody else like to raise their hand in favor of choosing just one or the other? 
because I'd like to know whether Scott is alone in, in its take on maybe you better have one or more people are leaning more towards Slinky and John's view of it's nice to have both. I'm going to start picking on people again. In, in defense of what I just said, <laughs> I think so because this is supposed to be kind of this uh, fundamental API that these the subscription APIs are using, I, I think it's better to be more explicit in, at that level of the API so there's no confusion. How far would you take that? Does the, <clears throat> do you want to take it as far as to say, okay, let's be more explicit because it's a formalized spec, therefore an implied and is not as good as an explicit and? Yeah, I wouldn't really want to put implied anything. Okay. At, at this level of the specification, right? Like at this level of the API, it, it should be very, very explicit. So you can look at it and, and really understand what it's going to do. Okay. Let me pick on somebody who, uh, okay, thank you. Lou, Lou, can you also comment on which one you'd prefer, implicit versus explicit? And in the meantime, Eric, do you have an opinion on this? I'm uh, in favor of uh, explicit. You're not in favor of, wait, you're not in favor of explicit or implicit? Explicit. So you want it implied? Uh, no, no, I, I, I don't like implied. Yeah. Oh, you don't like implied, okay. Uh, I'm not. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eric? I don't have a very strong opinion. Uh, I kind of think that uh, both could be all right, but I I haven't looked closely enough to have a good. Okay. Let me pick on one more person then. Um, Klaus, do you have an opinion on this one? Not yet. I, well, at first sight, I tend to agree with Scott, but I would have to think about the board it's to get a stronger opinion. Okay. <clears throat> Tell you what. I'm hearing both sides. Why don't we give people one more week to think about this since this was just presented today. I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, Slinky, you don't need a decision today. It's not blocking you from doing anything major, correct? Yep. Okay. So why don't people give it another week and then if it doesn't seem like there's an overwhelming majority on next week's call, then we may just call for a vote. Um, but please think about it. And in particular, if you can think about reasons why one or the other would actually be bad from for people from a usability perspective or something like that to help sway people i think that'd be really useful um because if it just comes down to a personal preference then that's gonna be a little harder to decide and then yeah it may just be a flip of the coin or a vote kind of a thing okay and in the meantime um is this correct would it be any of or it, it, i don't know jason's scheme at all i'm sorry open api at all is this um should it be all of is, is there an all of uh yeah. no 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 any of is fine uh but i think but but any validator will probably stop at the first match so i think this needs a bit of a work okay yeah the the, the, the any of and uh, any of and one of uh, difference is having massive effects on on the co-generators and what they what they put out so that's something that i'm I'm, I'm, I'm certainly going to go check out this PR and check it against the, um, the code generation stuff that I have. Um, because for the discovery, I've been building, I, I, not only did I build the discovery piece, but also the subscriptions piece that is front, fronting our service. And um, so this, will, this change will, will uh, cause quite a bit of churn in my, in my co-generated co stuff. So I'm... I'm curious how that comes out because that the, the truth then ends up in the code, and I think so. So I understand where that goes, um, but the I think the construct needs to look, needs to look a little bit, a little bit different. So my 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 intuition is that the any of in on line two twenty five that that's wrong. Okay, so well, you have a week to sort of do the exploration. So that's good. I'll try that out and we'll uh, comment because that's that's literally where I'm at right now. Okay, Slinky, your hands up. Yeah, uh, um, what I want to propose to you is that if we can agree on the spec change, 
what do you think if I do the schema changes in another PR and and we figure out uh, how to make the, the schema change proper for the um, for the code generators too, because I think to to make it working, uh, what we need is that we need uh, like to have um, the filter schema renamed as base filter, and then the filter schema is the is the actual one that has all of of the of the dialects, and then um, each of those have um, have, have properties. Um, sorry. Have, um, <laughs> It has optional properties, so yes. that's that's about yeah. the way we need to do that. Yeah, we, need, we need to we need to make quite a few changes for that for that change, um, and so there will be quite a bit of churn. So I'm um, having the um, the uh, the implicit the the implicit option will um, because the implicit option causes the filter object now to be now to have a list. So this here is a pure. So 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 this construct here is purely a tree, right? And um, uh, the um, um, and so this new option will be a bit, bit more difficult. Um, so yeah, I, I I think it would be good to go and split this into a into the, what the, the text what it should be, and then um, experiment how this works because JSON schema unfortunately looking at it <laughs> is. It's not telling you what the code will look like. <laughs> so in, in general, I don't have a problem with splitting it. My only question would be, is there any risk that we decide not to do this at all because the JSON schema or open API is, is too complicated and it makes the infrastructure too hard? Um, I don't think so. Okay. We're ultimately, we're ultimately just turning one, one, um, one thing that's just one object into a list. Um, but then the elements of that list still follow very similar rules. So we're building a, a, a more complicated tree, if you will, in, in the worst case. Okay, okay, that's fine then, Sleeky. Yeah, I, I think if you want to split it, that's fine. I just want to make mm -hmm. sure that we're not going to reverse our decision based upon the, the open but, API change. I, mm -hmm. I, can, I, I can see that the, the, the construct turning out in a way that the, the object that we're putting under a filter in the, in the in the top object is actually the same object today. Uh, the, uh, what is the all filter today? Because the all filter is a list of um, is an array of items. So that is probably the exact ob object that we want to go and fit there, um, and then go and so that becomes effectively the filter the the, the this container um, um, that sits at that at that level. Um, into which we then fit the filters. I'll, 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 I'm also going to take a look at that. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Because I have, I have some for the subscriptions API. I also have had a few, I think, uh, tweaks um, that I still want to go and add. Like I think there were some operation IDs missing or something. So, um, um, so I'll take a look at that too. Okay, cool. All right. So we'll hold off on the response. And, and, and I can help. So okay. yeah, just just being me. Perfect. The, 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 problem, the problem with those open ID specs, uh, open API specs is that the, the um, because JSON schema is such a complicated thing, the, the code generators are very um, uh, ticklish when it comes to certain contra constructs. And for some languages like Go, it's um, the polymorphism throws them off and there's, so we'll just have to go and try out how those things look in, in various in various languages and wh whether we, we we like the result and make that somewhat dependent on the tooling. I don't like that, but that's just what the state of affairs is with, with JSON schema. Okay, cool. All right, let's, let's move back then to this one now that you're on the call, John. Uh, you had asked for this one to be on the agenda because I think you wanted to talk about it a little with Clements, right? Can you... Uh, well, you you had said that uh, Clemens was the the we were waiting for Clemens to discuss this. Um, basically, I would like this uh, resolved in terms of are we getting rid of it or not, so that uh, when I publish a C sharp SDK version two, I don't include uh, an extension that's being removed. Um, 
So timing wise, it would be useful to make a decision. I mean, I could preemptively remove it and then add it back in if we decide not to remove it from the spec. Um, but it, it feels like it would be good to, to get some progress on it three months later. Right, so Clemens, can you bump this up on your priority list? Um, yes. Okay. I think what we wanted, what, um, I think where we landed was that um, the there was still clarification missing in this, what the role of that is relative to whatever happens at the transport level, right? But we also, I think we also landed then that we didn't want to go and cut it. Well, I don't know that we actually came to a formal decision yet. I think you had some ideas to try to alleviate some of uh, Slinky's concerns, but we needed to wait until we see that text to see whether that actually is true or not. Yeah, I'll I'll um, I'll promise for the next. Oh, we're canceling the next call, are we? Well, apparently. <laughs> so I, I'll I will I will get to this. I have I have started to um, make make time. Of course, you do. <laughs> I've started to make time to uh, put some more uh, effort into cloud events because I've all let you down and I, it's shown on the list so I'm going to do this, yes. Yes, yeah, so yeah, you don't have to wait for next week's call, obviously. If, if you can put some text out there and if offline over the next couple of days, Slinky looks at it and says, oh yeah, sure, that satisfies my concern, then I think that gives John a little more faith that it's actually going to stick or stick around. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put more effort into it. Sorry. Okay, cool. I always, I always feel super bad in front of uh, 20 people here. But I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't, certainly didn't mean to do that. No, no, you did, John. And thank you for that. We appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, moving forward. Du, 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 du. Okay. I think this one, let me just make sure I didn't skip one. Yeah, multiple X. Okay. So this one's another slinky one. Um, would you like to talk to this one, Slinky? Yeah. Yeah, I think nobody brought up any concern, any things that might break because of that. And I think the uh, the Linus, 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 I think it's pronunciation, comment is exactly what I'm trying to say here, which is that we should, yeah, exactly, yeah. is that we shouldn't enforce the fact that you can have in filters, uh, some kind of side effects, in particular in this kind of declarative filters. So I think we should drop this strong constraint. Okay, and just from, from my point of view, because I know I was one of the ones who was really worried about this. I, I, I tried to think of a concrete example of where the order would matter and I, I couldn't think of one. It still feels like there should be one, but I just couldn't think of it. So barring that from my point of view, I, I, I don't have a, a blocking concern. But Clemens, you may have had one because I think you spoke up last week as well. Did, did you have a concrete example where it would fall apart if we remove this must? Mm. Uh, since that ends up being, so logically, I think logically there is uh, no change and it just becomes a lot, it just becomes a local, local decision of what you want to go and do when and, and what you want to do first. So, um, I'm, I'm fine with dropping it. Okay. Anybody else want to chime in one way or the other? Okay. Any objection to approving then? Cool. Okay. And thank you, Slinky, for giving us one more week to think about it. Appreciate that. So, hold on. Approved. Okay. This one. Okay, so uh, I've had a very long outstanding AI to propose a restructure of our directory or of our repo. Um, what I was gonna, what I'm proposing is to create this directory structure and then move the appropriate files into the right, into the right spots. Um, I wasn't sure whether we wanted to create a bindings and format subdirectory under cloud events. Um, I don't think my PR actually shows that yet. Um, so for right now, everything, aside from extensions and adapters is at the top level of cloud events and so at the top level of our current repo. But we can move them later if you guys want to. That's the proposal. Um, anybody want to chime in? Yes, no? It feels like this probably uh, will end up being related to whatever I'm proposing 
for governance and branches and things. And I would ask whether we want to tie the versioning of all of these things together or whether maybe it would make more sense to have a, a repo for subscriptions and a repo for discovery, um, et cetera. Um, so if we make the repository the, the unit of versioning, as it were, I don't know whether that's the right thing to do. I'm just suggesting that we should consider it. Right, and in the past, I think we talked, I think the last time I talked about this was before you really joined the group. I think in the past, whenever we've talked about the possibility of creating separate repos for things like subscription discovery, the general consensus at that time was it's probably not big enough to, to warrant a separate repo. Um, but maybe things have changed and people's opinions have changed. Does anybody think we should actually create separate repos now or keep it where it is? I think Remy? If you, if, go ahead. If you go ahead to dis discovery and subscription are kind of tied a bit together, even like so. I don't think that uh, going into several repo will increase the visibility. I think it's going to be too much spread. I, I prefer like your folder structure currently. But the versioning, I do agree that we could kind of uh, change the versioning. But uh, I, I'm not a big fan of having like 10 repos to look after to just understand the whole project. But that's just and, my opinion. And that's fine. Um, but if do we think that it's reasonable to try to um, break apart the versioning of the main cloud event spec from subscriptions and discovery specs? Um, you know, I've, I've worked in repos that have the version by branch name because there is one, one version that covers everything in that repo. And I've worked in repos where tags are used instead because it covers multiple different aspects. Um, uh I do agree with you. I like the fact to split the versioning, like kind of what you find in JavaScript with like learner, which is basically multi versioning inside of the one repo. So, uh, and using tags, as you said, I, I like that idea. So John, let me ask you how that would work in practice though. Um, <clears throat> let's say we decide to version cloud events like we're doing today, mm -hmm. um, but then we need to version say, subscriptions more often for some reason. Yep. Um, what would the GitHub releases look like? Well, how would their numbering scheme look at that so, point? So, um, and this is spitballing with only limited knowledge and not having sort of prepared all of this, but I would imagine um, we could do the releases instead of just being 1.0.0, would be subscriptions dash 1.1.0 or whatever. And that would effectively give the context of the, the tag slash release, um, which I generally expect to be uh, a tag that points at a commit that changes the version number within the document, if you see what I mean. So, so we wouldn't, want, sorry, go ahead. No, so, so that implies then, I, I yeah, I think I need, to separate her out, you're right, because releases can be whatever, I guess, subset of files you want, technically, if, if you think of it as a bundle, like a zip file. But if we were to create a separate branch, that that makes it a little more interesting, doesn't it? Uh, yes, and I've personally found that most of the time you don't really need branches, um, you just need tags. And then if you need to effectively patch things, then you can patch via uh, create a branch at the given tag, I guess you do need to have a policy of how you do that. Um, so you could have a branch of spec dash 1.0.x and subscriptions dash 1.0.x if you wanted to create branches. Um, in but terms of the, the zip file associated with the release, I wouldn't actually bother trying to limit it. It's, it's more that if you're looking at a tag of um, spec dash or you know, maybe just cloud events uh, 1.2.0, if we ever have such a thing, then hopefully people would be aware that the thing that's being versioned here, that's being tagged is the stuff under cloud events and not the subscription stuff. The subscriptions bit could be part way through a different kind of change and you wouldn't particularly look at it. Um, so it's, it's a pin that's only relevant for some subset of the files. 
Yeah, but then I think I think you get into what I think Eric is mentioning in there in the chat, which is, do you get into some sort of weird compatibility thing, right? Because if someone jumps into the subscription version one branch, they will see the other specifications in that branch because you can't have a branch without doing the entire repo in the branch, yep. right? And so they're going to look at that version, or they may look at that version of the cloud event spec, but that may not be the very latest version of cloud event spec. And is that going to be confusing? And I guess that I would hope that the subscriptions um, documentation, spec, whatever, would say what version of cloud events it depended on, like a library dependency. Um, and so if we're part way through doing something with the cloud event spec and it's not really settled yet, that's okay because the subscription spec says, well, the version you should look at is 100 or 101 or whatever it is. Um, it's possible that we just don't really know how all of this will evolve enough to design a decent versioning system yet. Yeah, because I understand what you're saying conceptually. <clears throat> it's just in practice. I'm not sure how many people will think about, oh, I'm in this, this description API, I'm in the discovery API spec. Therefore, rather than just going look at other files in this directory or in this tree, I need now to go look at the readme to see which version and which branch to go look at to see the corresponds to this version of the discovery spec. I, I'm not sure people want to jump through that many hoops. Uh, like the way I do it is like uh, basically in the readme, I automatically update the readme whenever I do a release. So you can still put in the readme something that linked to like the latest uh, published version. And then your main, basically your main branch is like the working branch, but you the, the readme is updated every time that uh, you do a new release. And when you do the new release, basically your CI is just pushing the tag, modifying the readme. And like with conventional commit, you can automatically uh, create a versioning system. I have like an open source project who does that, that is not completely finished, but I could work on it and apply it to the spec if you wanted to see what it can look like. Right, but it's, it's my, the problem that I have is... So like this one. This matrix is going to get very complicated if everything is in version at the same time. No, it's just that uh, the latest release won't be the same version. The rest will be the same. No? Well, but, but let's say we have discovery on here and that's at version 0.5. Right. If I click on that link right here, that's going to take me to a particular snapshot of the entire tree, not just Correct. discovery, which means that version of cloud events may not be the right one that people should be looking at because that's a point in time statement. In the meantime, we may have released 102. Yeah, you're right on that one. Uh, and I guess one. that's where it depends. What, what does the discovery um, 0 0.6 or 0 0.5 depend on? Does it depend on 101? Does it depend on 102 or worse, does it depend on 10? We haven't really released this with a number yet. Right. So let me ask this, because this is, I don't want to rattle too much on this. Okay. Do you do we have to solve the versioning problem at the same time as deciding whether we want a new directory structure in here? I'm inclined to say we don't have to, meaning no. I think we could do this and then decide, oh. We like John's version scheme in the same repo. We say, no, this is getting too complicated. Nope, we need to split it out. And maybe these become their own repo separate from cloud events. And at that point, we can move everything back up into the top level because now it's just a cloud event spec or, or just a cloud events repo. It seems to me we can we can re almost make a secondary decision later as it, to see how versioning might affect us. But in the short term, it seems to me a grouping of directories would be helpful for people just to find stuff. One gigantic long list of files is kind of annoying. Yeah, the, the only downside of that is that uh, seeing a history of things is harder if it's moved around. It sort of feels like it shouldn't be. Git should know, oh, this was moved from the top level to under cloud events and back again, I will treat it as one file for history perspective, but I don't think it shows that way in GitHub. Oh, it doesn't. Um, I thought. I, I thought. The, I thought the history moved with it. I could be wrong, um, and I'm not sure it's a sufficiently compelling downside. Um, the other downside of doing this without having uh, decided on versioning stuff is it punts the versioning decision, and we may we may forget that we need to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell you what. Um, 
I don't want to rush this decision. Um, let me take the AI to go investigate. I, I really want to say that the history moves with a file because I don't think GitHub, I'm sorry, I don't think Git treats a move as a delete and a create. I think it treats it as a move and then the history goes with it, but I don't know for sure. And I will double check that because that, that may be part of our decision-making process. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and in the meantime, think about this, think about whether you, everybody think about this structure, think about whether you want another substructure under cloud events and think about whether we should resolve all this at the same time with the versioning stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make our life even more exciting. And so John, if you, want to think about what your versioning proposal would look like that might be useful discussion to think about when this comes back up on the next phone call that would absolutely be part of what i'm thinking about with the the governance change ai that i've that i've got on my plate okay um, and okay. i'm expecting whatever i come up with to be controversial just because versioning always is <laughs> yes okay slinky you get the last word yeah uh, i just want to say that like the discussion whether um, we present to our users the the spec versions. In my opinion, is not something we should we should solve in the repository. Like, like the first time I I landed in the cloud events spec repo, I was like, hey, why there's the link to the version and then the link to mass? It doesn't make sense. I I would prefer that we solve this solution. Uh, we solve we solve this kind of problem uh, at the website level. So in the website. Uh, we have proper links to the various uh, releases of, of the specs and for each sub spec we have the link to the spec or better the spec render at the straight inside the website which shouldn't be hard because it's marked on at the end of the day so yeah that's that's my last thought about that so i'll make sure i understand what you're saying there you're suggesting that <clears throat> that the links in the documents themselves Sort of resolve this problem for us, correct? No, I'm saying I'm saying that uh, the the readme needs uh, needs to help me navigate through the uh, through the repo, not through the spe all the spec versions. That's something that the website should do. So it's the uh, when I go to the website, I select what spec version, and then I get the list of the spec of the of the all sub specs, and I click on a on a sub spec, and I see it rendered on the website. So that would then though imply that someone could not do a git clone, uh, do a checkout of a particular branch and see everything that goes together. It can with a tag. So uh, I'm implying the fact that we have tags, okay? okay. But like, as, as, I said, as I said in the chat, uh, you need branches, like for example, 1.0, 1.1, 1.2 branches. If you need to do patch releases, Okay, so if you need at some point, so if at some point you release 1.2, but then you need to release 1.1.1. In that case, you effectively need like the branches, okay? But I don't think we, we ever had the need or we will ever need that. So it's a complication to be honest. And tags are more than fine, I think. Okay, okay, let's all think about that one. Okay. All right, so we're gonna hold off on that one, that's fine. Let's keep moving. Slinky, you are up again. <laughs> yeah, I op open the issue because uh, because oh. just looking at the PR doesn't make sense. This issue. Da -da -da -da. Yeah, so uh, basically uh, somebody opened an issue in SDK Java where he made me notice that there is this uh, paragraph in the Kafka spec that uh, is, is in contrast uh, with, with the sentence that is later uh, in the same paragraph. So one part of, of uh, one part of the uh, so the, the initial sentences are exactly like any other protocol binding we have. Okay, and it claims the usual stuff. So if the content type is present, the value is prefixed with application called event, then it's structured. Otherwise, it's binary. And but then. Uh, below there is the sentence, if the content type header is not present, then use structured mode with JSON event format. And yeah, the, uh, of course, of course the, 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 two, the two sentences are in contrast. And I propose, uh, I propose two, two different PRs 
uh, one excludes the other. So one PR is just that we align with other protocol bindings and we remove this the, 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 the other sentence, which is conflicting. Um, or the order is what I say, the more Kafkaesque approach. So in Kafka, it's not usual to, to send the content type header. Um, and that's, I think, the reason why there is this, um, the, why there is this sentence, because it's uh, very often you don't, you send just the message encoded and then topics, you, uh, you already know what kind of content type is in the topic. Yeah, and that's awful. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I'm, ju I'm just, let me finish the proposal. <laughs> um, the, uh, so the other proposal uh states uh states that if there is no content type uh so if there is no content type then it's json event format but without being in conflict with the first sentence so these are the two proposals and yeah pick one the the, the kafka thing is um is a very interesting one um because there is a um so the kafka has the has these the has there is the schema registry, but it's one particular vendor, and um, that is popular. And what that does is it effectively puts a puts a, a, a tag as a pointer into the schema registry, kind of into a magic leading uh, header inside of the payload. So instead of using the metadata, um, they're actually stashing the information into the into the header of the payload. And that then references the outside the outside metadata. The problem with that is, is that you can, without touching the, the the message, you can't tell what's inside of it. Like the only the only point when you can, when you when you can tell what's in inside that message, is um, when you um, when you deserialize it. That is okay for the narrow case of having to deserialize it, but it's terrible for dispatching. So if you want to, if, if you if you want to route a message that is end-to-end -end encrypted, for instance, um, then um, you can do this based on the criterion of what the content type is, um, because you can see it. But if you have to crack the message body, then you already have to go and engage the serializer, and you have to go and probably decrypt it. So that becomes becomes more more expensive, and that's why. And that should just be there. Well, well, don't get me wrong, Clemens, but uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not saying uh, where that one approach is, is is right and and the other one is wrong. I'm just saying that this is what Kafka developers are used to do. So that's why I propose this uh, the, this this approach with the content type. In but in in any case, that the spec I think now is wrong and has to be fixed. So one way or the or the other, but it has to be fixed. For sure. Yeah. So, Clemens, I, I, if I if I understand all this, the question before us isn't should people include the content type header, that whether that's good or bad is a different topic. This is you get a message, content type header is not there. What do we do with it? Do we treat it as binary or structured? What? Yeah, and, and we have a rule for how how those things should be formulated. I mean. Well, what is the rule? Because it seems, I, I'm misunderstanding, this, this rule up here says it defaults to binary. Down here it says it defaults to structured. That seems inconsistent. Wait, it's not present. Is, wait, uh, okay. Mm. By the way, this, this was added by you, Doug. <laughs> this, I, this I, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was added in some... Uh, yeah, I looked at the git blame. I'm not sure why it was added, to be honest. It, so, it, I, to be honest, since I am not a Kafka person, I may have added it at the same time I added it to like all the protocols just for consistency, and maybe that was wrong. Yeah, that may be. Indicating it's used to the, it is a structured mode. So, so for Slinky, when you say I added it, are you saying I added this or I added this or both? Yeah, no, the, the second one. The, the second, second one. one, okay. Mm -hmm. Say that it comes? So this that that I think that second the second one is um, incorrect. Okay. So you would agree then with this PR that just removes this. 
Yes. Okay, and this PR. So I, I, I wonder how we get there because there is a, um, the HTTP case. With the HTTP case, it's clear that yes, we so we need to have the content type to identify structured mode. Um, and then, and then if you leave that off, then it's implied to be, if if nothing else is there, it's it's application octet stream. And then it's effectively binary mode, if you will. Yeah. So this is so that sentence is is is, is in conflict. So, so when we, we uh, so so uh, so you added that. Apparently, but we, I'm just thinking. But, but, but apparently, we all said yes. Yes, I blame you, Clemens, ultimately for everything. So, <laughs> <laughs> collective idiots. Yes. Okay. So, other people want to chime in between having these two conflicting statements. The proposal is to remove this one. What do other people think? Any objection to heading that direction? Okay, so hold on a second here. Um, why is this not telling me what branch she did? Oh, there it is. There's the branch. So it seems to me this may need this may be a candidate for a 101 hotfix. Is that true? Because I mean it seems pretty bad if we have conflicting statements in 101, yeah. right? Yes. 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 Okay. Slinky, would you agree? Yeah, I can backport it. Okay. Yeah, or, or 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 you can do that. I mean, if you want, I can do that. Yeah, if you could do that, that'd be great. So, hope, first things first. Any disagreement with approving this change? Okay, cool. Well, In that case, yeah, let's reject the other one. Okay, hold on. Um, Slinky, open PR four v one hundred one, and you want me to reject this one, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is 813. Closing in flavor <laughs> of 813. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank you all. Technically, we're out of time. Let's just do a quick check. I think I got everybody. Did I miss anybody for the attendee list? All right, cool. In that case, we are done. If you're interested <clears throat> in the interop call, uh, hang on the line. And just a reminder, we will not have a meeting next week due to KubeCon. So we'll meet again officially in two weeks. Okay, cool. Thank you, everybody. And again, Bye. stay in line if you want to talk about interop. Thank you. In the meantime, I want to see what we do for HCP. I want to talk about interop. I just don't know whether I have the time. Well, I think it's going to be a very quick call. So, okay. yeah, it's... yeah, I have some stuff to say for once. <laughs> <laughs> for once, I like that. Um... So, Clemens, I'm looking. I'm not sure the HTTP spec actually has that sentence. So I'm just completely missing it. It talks about what to do if the content type header is there, but it doesn't say what to do if it's not there. Let me just double check here. Because that is technically illegal. Con think. No, you don't have to have the content type header on HTTP. Uh, I think you must. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong spec. Let's see. 7230. Hold on, let's pick another format. Oh, is that in 31? This is one of those weird headers, which is like referenced in, two, two, in, in 30, but then it's probably defined in 31. Why would I have added that to Kafka? I, I, 
I don't know Kafka well enough, so why the heck would I be the one that adds that? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> content type. Okay, no, this, okay, this was added by Slinky. He's, he, okay, he's trying to shift the blame to me. Hold on a minute. According to blame, this exact sentence was added by Slinky two months ago in 727. I like he's shifting the blame here. So funny. Uh, where is the sentence? See, the, the HTTP, so HTTP, um, as I said, the, app, the, the if a content type header is not present, the recipient may either assume a media type of application octet stream, as you heard that earlier, um, or exa examine the data to determine its type. So it's not required, but it's uh, it's implied that it's a binary then. Okay. Okay, no, I, I apologize. This was added, holy crap, two years ago by me. Or at least that was the latest update before him. Hold on. Maybe back then you have you knew about Kafka. And I, I would never claim that. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Another try clarifying Kafka. I must have done this on behalf of, of, of the group or something like that. I cannot imagine I would make these kind of changes on my own. That's an easy excuse, then. I well, because yeah. <laughs> I, 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 like I said, I do not know Kafka, and I'm looking at the changes here. And okay, okay, so it's been there a very long time. Anyway, it's not in the other specs, so I guess we don't need to. Well, do we? Do we need to worry about clarifying text for the other specs, like HTTP? You know, do we need to add something that says if the content type error is not there, what to do? Because as you said, Clemens, it kind of implies binary, right? Yeah. Okay, I tell you what, I'll take an AI to think to add that to a future agenda topic. Hold on. Do do do. If 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 the content type is not one of our well known. Um, well-known content types that we media types that we define for for our structured nodes and it's automatically binary and then, and then and then whatever and the content type that we find there or that's implied is then um is then that of, that of the body right okay so tell you what let's get back to the meeting at hand discovery all right remy you said you had something you want to talk about Yes, uh, so I did work a bit for once. Uh, I'm able to connect to your systems. Uh, I cannot share, sorry. Um, you, oh, do you want to share? I can stop. Yeah, I'll share, I'm just. Uh, okay, there you go. It's not like crazy new things, but at least uh, it's some progress. <laughs> so basically now like I see your system, uh, I can, see the ping service, but I need to implement because your subscription is basically, if I don't provide you with an interval for the ping, I guess uh, it doesn't send any ping. So I need to do the subscription configuration system in terms of UI. Oh, okay. And one thing that's what I was telling you yesterday is um, in fact, depending, uh, in my opinion, if I look to like the spec of cloud events, um, always with the, um, okay, it's not the, it's this one. the um, within mind the gateway, what I'm seeing here is like, we, we send back some services with a subscription URL and subscription config. But as soon as I put a kind of a, so a gateway in the middle, um, basically I have a chance that I have to overwrite all the subscription URL, a subscription configuration, and potentially the subscription dialects. By the way, there is a typo. I oh, know subscription dialect. No, you're right. It's wrong. 
<laughs> I was like, maybe it's optional. No, no, I'm okay. It's just a typo. But um, so the thing is, this will be overwritten because if I uh, act as a gateway, I have to be the middleman. So I'll probably, I can even have like a, a shift of network. So that means every service that I start to proxy, I need to rewrite their own definition to remove the subscription and put my own subscription uh, in place, basically. And that's why, uh, for me, it was a bit, um, I was thinking of even when you call the slash services to have like a subscription group that includes services, and then you like, that basically is a subscription system that can be overwritten but without changing the service. Because what I do not like there is when you act as a gateway, you take the service description that is written by the original service and you start changing the definition to inject your own subscription in it. And I had like issue with that. So I'm pretty sure I'm not explaining correctly what I'm saying. So I'm not sure if you follow what I want to say there, but uh, I can work on a peer on that, but it's more like when you act as a gateway, like the middleman, in my opinion, you should not have to temper with the service definition. You could take the service definition and just say, oh, by the way, you can subscribe through me with that type of subscription. And then you, you keep the original service definition as it was written by like the true service. And it's just the subscription parameters that are different from the original. Because I really think like um, in, uh, yeah, I need to write more. I, sorry, I, it's just because I, I was working on it yesterday night and, uh, and try to explain. But when you have like, uh, if it's an internal service that is exposed to your customer through a gateway, at one point, they won't be able to reach your internal service. So they won't be able to use the original subscription system. They have yeah. to go through an, a second subscription system. So can, can you share your screen again? I got a question for you. I, I think I understand why you would need to modify the subscription URL. So it points basically to your gateway instead. But can you elaborate on why you think you would need to change the config and the dialects? Well, because for me in the config, I can uh, think of uh, like, let's say you need to put your customer GWT token. Mm. or something basically kind of a security related and that is that can be additional to the original one yeah. uh, you can also define that uh, if it's an external there is some default parameters so you can even remove some su subscription config saying okay like yeah in my case like this one will always be this and like you know those break or in authentication or that i can see that I would have put there by default. But would those be, would the, auth the authentication thing that you just mentioned, would that be something that would be to be used by the, subscri the subscription manager when he's sending the event? Or is that a parameter that needs to be on the subscription create request itself? For me, it's just on the subscription create itself. Right, in that case, I don't think you want to modify the config because that config is meant to configure the entity sending the events or, or, or generating the events, okay. right? So you wanna add a header to the subscribe operation itself. And I'm wondering whether that's more of a protocol thing down below. So that's the way you see the subscription config because for me, whether I had trouble when I looked at yours is like, the, the way I was thinking is probably reverse of what you think. Because for me, my ping service, so I also have a ping service. And basically the ping service is emitting every five seconds because that's just the way the service is configured. So me as like a service provider, I'm just saying this is it. Because if I, if I have like five different subscriptions that ask me different uh, interval, then in fact, I have to start uh, like fourth thread. And basically I can have like a denial of service if I start having like a, millions of people who just on purpose ask for a different interval. And while, let's say if I'm GitHub, how do you see the subscription config? 
it's going to be your repository? I, I, well, I think, I think in the GitHub case, I think you can go either way, right? You could say the, the specification of the repository could be in the URL to which you send the subscribe, or it could be as part of the subscription config. It depends on how GitHub chooses to, to, to define the, the operation. Because like this one, if I subscribe, uh, I have a new bug uh, that I just generated, but uh, it will, um, the, I'm not in charge of how often the ping is sent. So I cannot interfere with the service just with a cloud event subscription. Because for me, the service is, uh, can be a complete app. So it's not like me as a subscriber who can define the configuration of it. Like if I take Salesforce or thing like that, I would expect to get some events but not to be able to kind of config Salesforce through the subscription config. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm following. Yeah, I, I do understand. Um, but but I, think, I think we need to clearly differentiate whether you're talking about modif being able to say that you need additional things on the subscribe request and that's separate from things that the event producer will need in order to either generate or send the event. Because those are two very different things. So like, okay, my case, uh, I'll try to explain it from where I start is I'm here and I'm like, okay, do has like uh, two services and I like to subscribe to one. If I right. just subscribe, when I subscribe, I need to give you the interval I want and there's a second parameter, it's a string, I forgot what it is probably the content of the, the event. So as a, when I do that, that means when I click on subscribe, I need to pop up like a form to ask the user, like what parameters do you want to ask? Mm -hmm. That means also I can have like as many subscription as I want on the same uh, service because I can resubscribe with different parameters and, uh, and continue like that. Mm -hmm. the, I'm just kind of thinking uh, out loud. I'm sorry, maybe there's no question, but that's the way I saw that. Why the, my thinking was more, it's already established application. So they already have their own behaviors and what like GitHub in my opinion already have his own uh, behavior or if I do my own application and they will start emitting events without me being able to choose because in a way, when I, sorry if I'm not, uh, yeah, when I subscribe to your ping service, that means the subscription configuration is basically telling your ping service when it should emit events. Correct. Why? While for me, like I should like the subscription has nothing related to the business logic of when my service should emit event because that's like business logics. So that's the own application logic. Correct, right. And there, there are definitely gonna be some services that fall into either, either category, right? There'll be some that you don't get to necessarily choose anything, right? It's just, yeah. it's just you're just, just connecting up to the stream of events. But then there will be others where it says, no, you can tell me more information about how you want these events to be generated or when they're generated or something like that. Yeah, um, so I guess I'm not, I'm not quite sure what you're looking for. But so that exp so I do. That's why I think our two vision is, is a bit different, and that's why for me the J weight like GWT token will be in the uh, subscription conflict because that means yeah, I'm that customer. I can subscribe. This is my proof, and so it will let you go in or out depending on the subscription conflict. So that's why I was seeing it there, but. Oh, okay. So hold on. I, okay. Hold on. Let me make look. So I think what you're saying is you were viewing subscription config as configurations for subscribing. Yeah. And, and I'm, and I, I believe the current spec is the other way around. It's subscription config isn't for, for, for configurations for subscribing per se, as much as it's how to configure the event producer itself when it generates or sends, or at least when it generates the events. 
I, th and I think what you're saying is we need some place to be very clear to says, hey, if I need additional parameters on the subscribe itself, these aren't, this is not gonna influence how the events are generated or how they're sent. It's just, you need additional information for me to let me even do the subscribe. Where yeah. does that go? Yeah, and that's the way I interpreted it. So probably wrongly, but, uh, but um, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm not sure where that would go. Um, maybe, maybe maybe it does go there. I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I don't, we need to talk about this. That's a good question. I don't know. Ah, cool. So that means I was able to explain a little bit correctly. <laughs> but uh, yeah, because for me. I don't see why the subscription will interfere with the business logic. So I, that's why, uh, even if I understand the argument on the ping service, to be honest, uh, so it's uh, another view that is possible. But I think most of the case should be like, I already have running services, I have running application, I already stream lots of events. So I'm not, it's not because you subscribe in a certain way that I'm gonna change my whole infrastructure for you. So that's why I was more seeing it like uh, as just a subscription parameters, like tell me who you are, what is your authorization, and like that. That's an. Can you do me a favor? Because I think this is a this is a great discussion that we need to have with the entire group, and just open up an issue and says, hey, where do I put configuration options for the subscribe call itself? You know, because okay. uh, I think I think that'd be a great discussion point because maybe subscription can take is for both. I don't know. That's a good question. We need to talk about okay. that. Yeah, so I'm happy because it's a little bit more con concrete. Like I think with like the, the UI, I fixed a few more things, but uh, I, we're making progress. And that's also why I'm not super vocal in the filtering parts. Because for now, I just want to have like the full, in like the infrastructure working and interoperability working well before the, before I even think about filtering events. Because for now, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, okay. Yeah. No, it's it's a, it's a good discussion point because I I, I think I agree with you. It, it, the spec is not clear today where that information would go, if anywhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else have a topic to bring up? And Clemens, I saw your, your Slack message. I just haven't a chance to, to click on your link to see what that actually points to, but I'll get to it later today. Oh, you're gonna share. Ooh. You're on mute, Clemens, if you're talking. Uh, now you can hear me. Yes. Um, <laughs> I built an Azure function um, that is proxying um, the Azure Resource Manager layer and is also proxying event grid. So this is a little unwieldy to look at. So I think I just pasted that in here. Um, so what it does is um, it basically creates a, it creates a discovery document um, that has um, effectively, every service that sits in an Azure resource group, so there's a storage service and there's a the function app is, itself, but I'm going to put, put some more there. So there's effectively, this is the, the blob store, I think. It's a storage account. And so that has all the events, so I'm enumerating all the events. I'm just pointing, I'm also pointing to the uh, respective um, schemas, uh, even though there's some, some detail missing here. And then I have a source template. Um, how you actually go in and define this. And that's a little wishy-washy. I need to go in and see that we, we have defined the source template thing, but the mapping of, of the data, uh, like the parameters is a little, like that's unclear to me at this point, um, how we're gonna make this work. Um, so this is the, so that's effectively what we get out of the storage account. And then we have here a, um, uh, a server farm. So that's the app service. And all the various operations that it can it can raise. So this is all just live and what we raise in in Azure. So so I haven't done any any translation work. This is original. And then um, what I'll do. Um, so these are effectively three resources which live inside of this inside of this uh, resource group in in Azure. And if you subscribe, you will be doing this through these um, subscription links. I need to add a little bit of, of, of extra data here. And then um, 
uh, I'm effectively taking our subscriptions API that we have here and proxy that off to um, to EventGrid so that you will be able to effectively interact with those Azure resources using the um, um, using our APIs. Cool. That's so exciting that, that it, that's, that's exciting that it's real. <laughs> Is, that is super real. So I'll, I'll also have the um, um, I'll have some resources which will go and, and do some um, automatic uh, raising of events. They will go and you know something will go and throw something into the blob store, and then that will raise an event. So these will just be real sort of resources. And and with this app, I'm going to give um, um, access effectively into those resources without requiring. Um, um, I'm, 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 I'm making a little hole into Azure, if you will, so that you can go and subscribe to those events without requiring authorization. Cool. That'd be neat. I like it. So it's, that is mostly done, but I have to go and patch up some holes and make it more approachable. Like you should be able to get the, like this, the subscription URL, URLs that I have here should be um, more straightforward. It might be some information missing. There's also some like, as I'm filling out all the data data, there's some stuff that looks fairly repetitive and I'm not yet sure whether I like that repetitiveness. Like you have, I have four times the, the four times the same URL and I need to think about whether that's that's a, a, a same thing or whether we can probably go and consolidate the, the, the metadata a little bit more. Yeah, good thing to discuss, yep. So there, um, so, uh, in two weeks when we meet again officially, then there will be certainly more and this will be more rounded. Yep. Cool. Um, yep. I also have, um, for everybody to go and take a look at, if you guys want to um, want to peek, um, I have this in a repo. So it's not that I'm doing this in private, I'm actually doing this very much in the open. So I pasted it in the chat window if you want to feel it. Don't expect docs or anything. <laughs> so in source, and there's some, there's a, this is a client. Um, the, the client is actually, is kind of fun because it's using the Azure Relay. Um, so it's creating a little, it's creating a little, if you scroll down a little bit further, um, it goes and creates this, this start event listener thing is, um, actually creates a hybrid connection listener. So it creates an HTTP listener that executes on your local machine and that has an endpoint in Azure and that where effectively the HTTP request comes down to your to your local dev machine. And um, so you can go and subscribe um, from the Azure service into that endpoint and the Azure service will call them a public HTTP endpoint, but the public HTTP endpoint will end up on your own local box. That's like NGROC, but we have we have that too. So I'm using that for for my own purposes here. Are you familiar with that with with uh, with NGROC, Doug? Doug? I'm sorry, I'm a mute. No, I'm not. I'm not familiar with that, unfortunately. So it's it's effectively you creating it's a WebSocket based delegation of listening to to connections and then those connections being are being proxied to your own machine so uh, it feels and looks like if you're listening um on your on your local machine but the dns and the actual um, um endpoint is provided in the cloud that's but, cool but the http requests come to you that's really cool yeah basically just uh whatever reverse to know it's this the, it's the Azure Relo service. I'm just, I'm just using that for my for my for my demo here, um, to just to play with, so that you can actually go and debug when events are being raised, etc. That all just comes to you without you having to futz on the server. Um, and then um, and, and you can be behind NATs and firewalls and it just works. Um, and then and then the other project. So this is the client, and then you go back. Um, there's actually the server. In, in source, there's the the other project. So that's the, the event grid project. And there's a bunch of JSON files, which I stole from the, um, um, I had to go and, and steal those from from um, from some other place in Azure. 
um, because I don't have access to these types, but these are all the event types that are being thrown to event grid. So they are just there. And there's um, the subscription service is implemented there and the discovery service is implemented there. So that's a subscription service. That's basically proxying, if you will, the, um, the, the event grid service then. Cool. So, uh, so. Clemens, I was also looking at the schema registry spec. Yeah. Because I'm thinking of just like putting uh, something online already that looks a bit like NPM to be able to publish publicly. The service registry in event hubs? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it exists already. That's why I'm talking to you. Uh, we have in event hubs, we have a service registry as a preview that is, ah. <laughs> that is a version of. Um, that implements, I think, the zero point one version of the of our schema registry. Because when I look at the schema registry, one issue I got was like there is no group. Uh, it was there. Well, we have, so so our schema registry that we so the schema registry that we implemented for the Azure Event Grid has schema groups. It's literally the 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 initial spec that we submitted into this into this effort. Is the same. It's the same schema that we used for our our preview. Okay, um, it's great. I think uh, the fact that it's uh, attached to Azure might uh, be an issue for some people. But um... well, I mean, the point the point of, of doing this is that we um, um, that everybody can implement this, right? So I mean. And Doing the schema registry uh, implementation is is actually fairly easy because you only need to have a file store on the bottom. Yeah, yeah, it's super easy. Like you just need like so. I have like a serverless framework that I did, so I can use it on AWS. But can deploy also on Azure with function, and then you just store like a, yeah, with, the, like a, a NoSQL, or you can even use a like a blob store if you don't want to do any search, and and that's about it. Then it's just a few and like. Plugging probably GitHub uh, authentication to be able to authenticate who publish uh, the, the registry, but that's, a, but that's about it. But I, was, I think it can be super useful. So, yeah, I was maybe thinking of looking into it and do like a small project for that. Uh, if you think it's useful. But now that I see that you already have something, maybe we should, I should just say, okay, use that. Yeah, so so our goal, so so one of the things that we want to do, like we have clients which are talking to that schema registry that we have, um, and uh, those and we have them for all the all the SDK languages that we have, so .NET and Java and JavaScript and Python, and um, we um, so those clients will work against the against the C, against whatever whatever Open API specification we end up with. Okay. Yeah. So maybe I still I should still do something so this way people can like have their own if they want or, or use like a generic one. Uh, yeah. I see. I look more into it. Thank you very much for the information. Uh, You're welcome. Okay. Cool. Anything else people want to talk about? All right. In that case, it's lunchtime for me. Yay. All right. <laughs> okay. Talk to you guys or see you guys in two weeks. Bye. Yeah, everybody. Bye. bye. Oh, and Clemens, don't forget this to register for the. the I, I did for, for the two events already registered. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Talk to you guys later. Bye.